Hello and uh, welcome to this week's edition of Politics Today and in this programme we'll be talking about how children are being indoctrinated with liberal progressive ideologies and uh, children's uh, innocence are being taken away through our national education system. And in this programme today, I'm joined by uh, Maureen Martin, who is the president of the Christian People's Alliance, together with uh, Hugh Kitson, uh, a Christian filmmaker and producer. So welcome to the programme. Um, Maureen, it's good to have you uh, back on, on the programme, and uh, it's a good opportunity for you to uh, give our, our viewers an update, uh, particularly as we've had three very important by-elections uh, recently, and uh, you've got your big... Uh, annual political conference coming up at the end of September as well. We do indeed. Thanks for having me back, Simon. Yeah, we had a couple of big elections, Uxbridge and Somerton and Frome. The Uxbridge by-election was very crowded, like 17 candidates. So when it's crowded like that, the votes are pretty much scanty for the other candidates. So most people voted Labour or Conservative, as you could imagine. Somerton and Frome did much better because the field was much smaller. So we did much better in that one. But going forward, the two-party system is not working for us as a nation. We really have to look at that, because as we can see, it's like Hobson's choice for the electorate at the moment is bad or badder, <laughs> worse or worse. So yeah, uh, we do have to look at that going forward. But um, yes, we do have our annual assembly coming up in the end of September. It's going to be in Birmingham this year. We've got some great speakers, We've got Reverend Bernard Randall. Remember, he was actually fired from a Christian college for just preaching about family values. He's going to be one of our speakers. We've got some from the Barnabas Aid, um, they are involved in supporting persecuted Christians around the world, so they're going to speak. We also got the officers of the CPA, myself. We've got Sid Caller, who's a leader, and we've got Tom Rogers, who's our deputy leader, and they'll be speaking. So please come along, it's going to be great in Birmingham. Please go up to our website, um, cpaparty.net, and please be aware when you go to that website, there is a spammed website there ahead of us. So please make sure it's cpaparty.net, and you can find the link to Eventbrite there to get tickets. So please book and come. Thank wonderful, you. Wonderful, wonderful. And uh, Hugh, it's uh, great to have you uh, back, uh, particularly on, on, on politics today. Um, I, I didn't really know the extent of the problem that we have in our education system until we kind of start researching a little bit. And, and I'm sure that uh, parents are kind of must be horrified as well by, the ex mm. by what our children in schools are actually being taught. Um, share with us what, what your education was like when you were at school. Well, uh, I was at school in the 1950s and 60s, uh, which is really is a bygone era. era. I'm, I'm old enough to be your dad, <laughs> yes, and I'm probably are. old enough to be uh, Maureen's granddad. <laughs> but um, basically, uh, we had an academic um, uh, education in those days. We learned basic subjects like English, maths, and then there were languages like French and Latin, um, English literature, history, geography, uh, uh, science, and so on. So it was, it was basically academic. But there was one other difference. I went to um, what is today called a public school, which is in fact a private school. And um, it was a Church of England, although it wasn't actually attached to the Church of England as such, it nevertheless the, the Christian ethic was there. Now, I didn't know the Lord personally in those days, but I have to say, even though I didn't know him, I had this grounding. I knew that I was a created person and that there was a God who loved me and that I was accountable to him. So that was in my head. Uh, it was later on that I came to know the Lord personally. But I believe that that is one of the big problems today, that children are not having that grounding at all. No, it's amazing that you had that grounding. And uh, it is a, a privilege you've had it, because it's obviously uh, prepared you for all the mm. uh, excellent films uh, and documentaries that you produced over the decades, Hugh, so thank you. And uh, Maureen, if I, if I recall my kind of education at school in the 80s, uh, you know, we had uh, school assemblies, we had uh, hymn books, we, we had the public reading of scripture and also religious education. So it was still probably the last bastion of our Judeo-Christian heritage that we're living in, that, that so Christianity still played a role I I in our schools. Uh, show us what your experience was like. 
Yes, I mean, I went to school in the 70s. I hate to burst your bubble. <laughs> I'm a bit older than you think I am. Um, I went to school in the 70s. I started in the mid 70s. And just like you, we had Christian assemblies. In fact, at the end of each day, we used to actually turn our um, chairs on tables and said a prayer at the end of each day. Do you, do you oh, believe that? that? We wow. actually said a prayer. Amazing. We would recite the prayer. It wasn't the Lord's Prayer. It was a sort of a edited version of it, but we knew it off by heart. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Primary school children. I wasn't a Christian. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. But just like you, Hugh, I sort of had this knowing that there was a God and I would be accountable to him to one day. Mm. And that day did come that I became a Christian. But there was this knowing that there was a God. I didn't know anything about Jesus, but I knew there was a God. And the, the, the experience I had at primary school in particular reinforced that knowledge. And when I went to secondary school, yeah, we had um, religious education and um, Christianity was taught in a very positive way. So yeah, my experience of going to school was that it was Christian based and that, that knowledge that there was a God never left me even through my schooling. So a very similar experience to you and, and Hugh, actually. So. Amazing, amazing. Uh, and Hugh, what were your thoughts on a, a recent report that was published in the uh, Daily Telegraph recently under the title, uh, Lockdown Harmed Nearly Half of Children. Apparently that the lockdowns has damaged the emotional development of almost half the children's kind of surveyed. And, uh, and what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I have to say that I'm not an expert on, on this but I can imagine that children living in a high-rise building in London uh, in cramped conditions would have felt completely and utterly imprisoned. And so would the, the parents or those looking after them. Um, my grandchildren who are out in Melbourne in Australia, Melbourne actually had more lockdown days than any other city on earth. I care about that. But fortunately, um, because my uh, son and daughter-in-law are quite well off, they've got a nice house and they've got a garden at the back, it didn't affect them so much. But what, what really did affect children, uh, even my grandchildren, was the lack of mixing with their peers. And um, you do, you feel very cut off in that, in that respect. And uh, yeah, Maureen, uh, yeah, we're now seeing that uh, the lockdowns have, have caused a number of kind of social problems in society, um, but mainly especially for, uh, for children. And according to the Daily Telegraph article, parents are worried that their children have lost confidence um, and they're more prone to traumas and low moods and that children's social and emotional skills have been were massively weakened during the first year of the pandemic. Um, are we not in danger of losing an entire generation of children if this is not rectified and addressed quickly by the government? Absolutely. Um, and another thing to point out in that um, assessment is it's not always the government's responsibility to address everything. The government is not our nanny. It's not a nanny exactly. state. Children are only as resilient as their parents are. So really what we need to do is we support the family structure. Give the family structure support to get back to that pre-pandemic state. And ironically, the very institution that could have provided that additional support was also locked down during the lockdown, which is the church. The church could have stepped in there and to provide the support those families needed, but that was also locked down. The church should have been an essential service. And unfortunately it wasn't. So we were, the church was deprived the opportunity to provide, provide the support it could have done to those families, particularly the, the poor ones who had the high rises, children couldn't go out and play. You know, they were deprived in so many different ways, not only of the education, some were not educated at all during that period of time because they didn't have the resources, they, they're one parent families, they just couldn't handle the fact that the children were now, you had to look after them 24 seven they just couldn't provide resources to educate their children. So they were damaged in more ways than maybe more affluent um, families were. And, mm -hmm. and another interesting sidebar to the lockdown is that parents were now exposed to what their children were being taught. They could now see it. And this obviously kind of exposed parents to the fact what was going on. 
in uh, the exactly. system. Which takes us to where we are today. Exactly. We'll unpack further yeah. in the programme. Um, Hugh, what are your thoughts on how uh, children in primary schools are now being taught um, sex education lessons, are being taught about uh, liberal uh, progressive issues and values, gender issues? Uh, and isn't this kind of indoctrinating them into a kind of more promiscuous lifestyle? Absolutely. I mean, when I go back to my own childhood, and it probably applied to you, um, I, I knew nothing about sexual relations much before I got to puberty. Uh, I'm afraid the situation is somewhat different these days in that children are being sexualized at a very young age. I mean, what they see on television, what they can get on the internet, and, and so on. And it's, it's just appalling. And, I, you know, I think some of the evidence of the evil of this day is in the fact that so many young children and certainly uh, teenagers are experiencing uh, mental issues that they, that at my age, and probably yours too, um, they would have never experienced. And, and it's all to do with this sexualization and their, 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 their childhood is literally being robbed. Yeah. Uh, uh, Maureen, you know, what happened to protecting the kind of innocence of, uh, and children? Um, and why do they need to be taught about the, these uh, particular issues when they haven't reached uh, puberty? And, and isn't there a great danger as well that this is forcing children to grow up a lot quicker than they're actually ready to grow up? And, and what happened to children being allowed to enjoy their childhood uh, rather than dealing with all the challenges of adult when they haven't even reached puberty? Exactly. They don't need to be taught these things at that age. It's totally unnecessary. Age-appropriate material is age-appropriate. And some of the material is not age-appropriate, I mean, as we've seen. So the whole idea is to rob children of their innocence and expose them to materials that will kind of corrupt them. Let's just use a, you know, the word that is corrupt them before they need to be, uh, you know, exposed to these certain subjects in this particular way. At that particular age, I think sexual education should be the responsibility of parents to Absolutely. introduce it very gently and very, um, you know, age appropriately to their children. And then as they get older into secondary school, they're prepared for more information. But even that information needs to be delivered in a certain way. It still needs to be age appropriate. We don't need to be exposing to pornography and things like that. It needs to be appropriate for their age and then they can make decisions based on the information they receive as to what they want to do with their, with their lives. Ideally, it should be based upon morality and Christian values. Like, I, I'll give you an example when I was at um, secondary yeah, school. Um, we were having sex education and the teacher was talking about contraception and she said, the best form of contraception is the word no. And that, I was 14 and that stuck with me all of my life. She must have been a Christian. I'm pretty sure 100% she was a Christian. And I thought, yeah, 100%. Bullproof. Amazing. Absolutely. Um, you, you just used the word corruption there. Children are being literally corrupted morally and spiritually and in every way. And just to use an example, uh, the other day there was a, a news story on the BBC about uh, an 18-year-old girl who came out and said, talked about how she was sexually abused by her grandfather. Now, as a little child of four or five, when this, was, this started, she'd have known nothing about sex, but it completely defiled her inner being. And it's because God has made us for a particular type of sexual relationship, and that is within marriage between one man and one woman. Absolutely. And uh, uh, Maureen, uh, we know that uh, racism is completely wrong, it's unacceptable, and it's a, a, a sin uh, bef before God. But what are your thoughts on this uh, recent news story that was covered by the Daily Mail? Um, that we, we're seeing that a CEO boss who owns a 30 million pound firm is uh, producing materials on white supremacy for uh, British school children as young as four. Completely atrocious. It, it should not happen. 
because there's not, as far as I'm concerned, personally, there's not things like white supremacy. This is teaching children how to be racist. And you have to divide, define what racism actually is. And when you divide, define what it is, what the CEO is doing, he's promoting racism in schools. Should not be allowed. If this person's allowed to you know, distribute this sort of material, um, the parents need to be exposed to it because it will be part of the curriculum. So the parents need to be consulted upon it. And I hope that happens. And if parents are exposed to this material, they say no. I really hope that happens because this is just not acceptable at all. Yeah. And I'll take you a step back. Can you just define for us what racism is? is racism is basically... Person of colour and how you think that introducing white supremacy teaching is effectively racism. Right. Definition is treating someone differently, positively or negatively, based upon the colour of the skin. That is racism. End of story. That's it. So when you talk about white supremacy, you're trying to say that a person is superior just because of the colour of their skin. It's completely erroneous and completely wrong. It goes against everything we believe as Christians. It goes against facts. It goes against history. It goes against everything. It's just not real. It's not factual. So that's the basis of what racism is, and that's what he's trying to promote in schools. Yeah. And um, uh, Hugh, uh, what are your thoughts on what we're now seeing as a kind of racism period or white, supremis, uh, white supremacism period as a guideline given to uh, teachers to uh, teach uh, about racism? And teachers are also are telling five-year-olds um, that uh, they are strongly biased in favour of whiteness uh, and are taught about uh, priest brutality. Well, I think they're feeding these children a complete and utter lie. Um, what they're being taught is almost a form of apartheid, actually, only it's in reverse. I mean, in South Africa, uh, the, the black person was seen as being not fully human, not fully, you know, um, as 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 white people were seen and it's absolutely not true so what we're seeing today with this is is a form of being taught apartheid it's different but it is nonetheless in my view apartheid yeah uh, uh maureen also we're seeing that uh, a lot of this uh, uh education now going into our schools regarding uh, critical race theory uh, is all based on uh, kind of America's experience. Uh, and of course, we had the horrible segregation of the South, um, you know, the slavery of, uh, of uh, African Americans and America divided. And we're now seeing American history and education now be imported into our country when we didn't even have, for example, segregation I in this country. And also, not only that, but, but during the Second World War, for example, um, when the US Army had segregation and uh, we had uh, kind of uh, white so American soldiers in one base and there'll be all African Americans in one base and they didn't mix, uh, found out that the, uh, the British public welcomed a lot of these African Americans into their home and they felt a normalization. And it actually then triggered what's known as the uh, civil rights movement because their experience here in the UK and how they were treated. So how can you bring in uh, a history that is so different, uh, uh, particularly the African-American experience in the United States, to the experience here in the UK? Well, they're basically based on the slavery experience. And uh, Britain was involved in slavery, we know that. It's, no, it's, it's a fact of history. And they're trying to make the, the connection between the American slave of you know, the Americas and the British Islam in the Caribbean and other parts of the world. This is the connection they're making. But it all boils down to the same thing. You know, we're trying to, they're trying to say that we need to treat people differently based upon the colour of the skin. The histories don't really match. They're making the connection just because of the slave trade, but also, you know, disregarding the fact that most of the people on the Underground Railway in America, for instance, were white Christians who were helping um, slaves escape. Most of the people in this country, Will Wilberforce is a great example. Absolutely. Who, you know, spent his, most of his entire life trying to get the slave trade banned in this nation, was clearly a white man. He was working with others who were, you know, mixed. There's, there's other people who were um, black in part of his, his group, 
but essentially he was the main person leading the charge in his country. So you can't ignore those facts. So, yeah, go ahead. An interesting part of this article, which I also read, was that they were trying to discourage the, um, the mention of what Wilberforce did to try and end the mm. slave trade. Yeah, there's a particular um, phrase for that one, isn't it? it, it it's uh, essentially called uh, white saviour syndrome. That's um, right, And yes. so therefore you, we can't talk about William Wilberforce and what he did in Parliament to end slavery because that's seen as a kind of being a white saviour and praising white people. Okay. Um, it seems to me that this is actually bring, tearing children apart because at the age of five at primary school, a, a child is not going to see any difference between say a, a black person or an Asian person um, or you know, um, a, another kind of colour person from another particular race, they're, to them they're just children. Exactly. So, so why are they, the teachers and this education now coming in when they're actually looking to divide children rather than actually giving them a kind of universal education, valuing them all equally and valuing their, their cultures equally as well uh, and saying, look, and that's the great thing about the church. Uh, that's what makes the church so special because it, it is the blending of cultures and nations into the body of Christ, mm. all equal under God. Um, what would you think are the dangers of if this education system is not being challenged? Because it appears to me, from my impression, that the kind of racist card is being used to bring authoritarian measures uh, and pursue a kind of globalist agenda. And, and unfortunately, this does nothing to push back on, on racism. Well, it's, it's actually going to cause racism race riots and, and, and so on. It's, it's actually um, lighting a blue touch paper uh, and instead of trying to solve um, race problems, it's actually going to exacerbate it. Uh, and in fact, the, the part of this indoctrination is they, they say that um, you shouldn't ignore the different races. Yes, we. It is absolutely true. I'll give you a very good example in the church, for instance. I believe we've got a lot to be thankful for, for um, Africans who've come back to the UK and they're a vital part of the church here. The Bible-believing church largely is African origin based here in the UK. It's amazing. No, absolutely. Uh, and share from us uh, your experience of, of how, you, Maureen, you'd like to see the education system reformed uh, to reflect uh, racism and actually to actually challenge it directly without this kind of Marxist undertones or this Marxist agenda w which is underneath this critical race theory. Absolutely. We need to go back to the original definition, as I said, what racism actually is and go from that starting point that all people are valuable regardless of their colour. Yeah and be treated with respect. Go back to the biblical foundations for humans re interacting with each other. You know, I mean, Paul said himself, there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free, we're all one in Christ. And that is the biblical basis for how we're to interact. And the church is supposed to model that Absolutely. to the rest of society. That's why we are called to shepherd and disciple nations, because we're the ones who are supposed to really display God's glory in how to do life essentially, and it should be reflected in our educational system as well. Teachers need to stop indoctrinating our children, start educating them. Okay, the government needs to abandon all these crazy, you know, you know, curriculum things that they're putting into place that are just not in line with a good moral foundation that children need to be given. Okay, if they're not given it in their homes, not every home is Christian, at least when they go to school, they should have some basis for morality that they can base life decisions on, good life decisions. And that's not happening. And as a result, we see a society that's breaking down. Mm. Absolutely. And, and, and um, Hugh, I think we've uh, gone over quite comprehensively the challenges facing Christians in school with our state education. Um, there, there is growing cause for, for Christians to come out of the state education and adopt homeschooling. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I know neither you, yeah. us, any of us are real education experts, but I think this is a growing problem. Uh, and the one thing that we should care about is, is protecting the morality and the beliefs of, of, of children. Well, a lot of parents, uh, Bible-believing parents, 
are already doing that. Certainly in our church, there are a number of uh, families that are home educating their children. I've come across them in America. And I have to say, this is my own experience of meeting um, children and young people who've been home educated. They're very well rounded. Um, they've got good social skills and they know and love the Lord. Okay, coming out into the world at the end of their homeschooling can be a problem, but doesn't have to be a problem. Uh, I believe that that is the way to, to go, really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and Maureen, um, how is uh, CPA, the Christian People's Alliance, tackling the issue of education and particularly these uh, outside forces that are investing huge amounts of money on education system to uh, kind of alter uh, really the kind of value systems and ideology that our children are facing. So the Christian experience that all three of us had at school uh, for the generation of children now, uh, you know, th there is no such thing. So, so how will CPA try and rectify that? Well, our slogan at the moment is we want moral education. That was what we ran on in Oxbridge and um, Summerton and Rome because we recognise that many parents are dissatisfied with what their children are experiencing in schools. When you talk to them on the street, they're like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not happy with it. They're not necessarily knowing exactly what to do about it, but they're not happy with what's going on. And we want to get back to education, not indoctrination. We want our children to be educated with what matters in life, maths, English, the sciences, so when they get to the point where they want to make career decisions, they're prepared and they have the world as their oyster, as it were, because they're ready. Not all this other stuff. We don't want them indoctrinated robots. <laughs> you just have one ideology. What we want is children who are well-rounded, well-rounded adults. You present with, to them different theories. You can teach CRT, but as a theory, okay, and teach all the negative aspects of it. There are no benefits to it. But you can say this is a theory and these are all the negative aspects related to the theory. Just like creation and evolution. They should be taught side by side and let the children or the young adults decide. At the moment, it's only evolution that's taught in schools and not creation. They should be taught alongside each other. Let them decide. At the secondary school level, they're old enough to make their own. So, uh, Maureen and Hugh, thank you so much for being my guests uh, for this week's Politics Day. Really appreciate your, your work and your input. Thank you. And I want to thank you for watching this programme at home. We, we know that uh, children are going back to school, and this is something that you have to seriously think about putting your children into our state education to protect them and their values. So, thank you for watching this week's edition of Politics Today. <laughs>